everyone, depending on where you are connecting us from. Welcome and thank you to those joining us live and those who will be watching the recording afterwards. Please let us know by typing into the chat box below uh, from which country and organization you're joining us from, whether you're a faculty member or a practitioner or a pharmacist student. I would also like to warmly welcome our speakers and our moderator, whom I'll hand over to shortly. My name is Nilhan Uzman. I'm a pharmacist trained in Turkey. I'm the lead for education policy and implementation at FIP, working closely with the education community in global pharmacy, including pharmacy educators, pharmacy schools, students, and young professionals. I'm leading FIP's UNESCO Unitwin program. FIP UNESCO Unitwin program was established in 2010 between FIP, University College London School of Pharmacy, and UNESCO. The FIP UNESCO Unitwin program was the first ever in the field of higher education for health professions and the first for global pharmaceutical education. It is currently led by Professor Ralph Altieri, FIP UNESCO Unitwin Director at FIP. Professor Altieri will be moderating today's webinar. The FIP UNESCO Unitwin program seeks to advance research, training, and curriculum development in pharmacy education by building university networks and encouraging inter-university cooperation worldwide. It has a particular focus to promote gender equity and empower of women in science and education to achieve their full potential. It is a platform for FIP to implement the global pharmaceutical education and workforce strategies. The FIP UNESCO Unitwin Center for Excellence in Africa has FIP's active regional network since the program's inception in 2010 and its partners, who are the leaders of the Sub-Saharan African Schools of Pharmacy from Ghana, Zambia, Namibia, Nigeria, Uganda, Malawi, and Kenya, participating, facilitating the development of academic capacity, implementation of needs-based education strategies, and establishment of enabling pharmaceutical policies through advocacy to transform pharmacy education. Since 2010, the FIP UNESCO Unitwin Center for Excellence in Africa Network has been an incubator of transformation in pharmacy education. And to celebrate these achievements, FIP is publishing the FIP Pharmacy Education in Sub-Saharan African Report in October this year to demonstrate 10 years of impact and evidence in African pharmacy education. Stay tuned, follow FIP's website, social media for the launch of this first of its kind report on African pharmacy education. Today, FIP UNESCO Unitwin Center for Excellence in Africa is pleased to be delivering the 28th episode of Responding to the Pandemic Together series of FIP. Inequities in pharmacy education have not been new to the world, but due to, due to COVID-19, there have been greater disparities in education and training of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences students globally. Today's episode, Addressing Inequities in Pharmacy Education Due to COVID-19, Learnings from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, will identify existing and COVID-19 induced, induced inequities in pharmacy education and will present good practices from Zambia, Namibia, Chile, Nigeria, India, and Vietnam on how to tackle them. At the end of today's panel, we would like to leave you with tools and reflections on how inequities in pharmacy education can be addressed in your country, and will provide you support with all-inclusive educational policies and resources. Some logistics to share before we start. Please feel free to send your questions through the Q&A box, and please let us know which speaker should answer your question. We'll be picking those up throughout today's session. Please note that this event is currently live streamed on FIP's Facebook profile. It is recorded and the recording will be publicly made available on FIP's website, www.fip.org. And uh, we have an information hub in our website for coronavirus and all COVID-19 re related resources. So you can visit our website. This is an opportunity for me to invite you also to join our Facebook group, COVID-19 and Pharmacy where you can join a global network of pharmacists to network, discuss, and share experience in solidarity to combat our, this pandemic. You will receive some questions during and after this event for feedback. Please share your feedback with us so we'll improve and provide you events that are relevant for you. That's all from, from me for now. And uh, now I'm pleased to hand over to our moderator, 
for today's panel, the FIP UNESCO Unit and Director, Professor Ralph Altieri. Professor Ralph Altieri is the Dean of the University of Colorado SCAC School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in the United States. Within FIP, he's the Interim Chair of FIP Education, as I mentioned, Director of FIP UNESCO Unit and Program, Immediate Past President of Academic Pharmacy Section, member of FIP's Academic Institutional Membership AAM Advisory Committee, and FIP AIM Leadership Program Task Force and FIP's Congress Programming Committee. Over to you, Ralph. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nilhan, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on this uh, Zoom call. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to uh, serve as the moderator for this event, to welcome each of you, and to thank you for joining us today. Um, we're all familiar with inequities in the world, in our regions, in our countries, and perhaps even in our communities. And these inequities have many different root causes. Many are systemic in nature, and we need to do whatever we can to overcome them and create a better, more equitable, and just world. As Nilhan mentioned, COVID-19 has forced these inequities to be front and center and make us uh, painfully aware of of what those inequities are. Certainly in the world of healthcare and pharmacy, these inequities encompass access to care, quality of care, public health capacity, leadership, workforce, and more. And for many in the COVID-19 pandemic, these inequities become a matter of life or death. Today, we're gonna to explore, as Nilhan mentioned, the inequities in pharmacy education, ranging from localized inequities in our own institutions to those that span the world, whether they arise from socioeconomic standing, race, gender, or disabilities of individuals, academic institutions, infrastructure differences, or policies that exist within our uh, countries or even universities. So this session seeks to highlight how those inequities affect the process of pharmacy education and gain insight into good practices that can curb the negative consequences of these inequities uh, from our colleagues in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The format is a panel discussion, and it's my privilege to introduce our panelists at this time. All of them have both national and international perspectives on pharmacy education from their positions within their universities and schools and in international organizations, including, of course, FIP. I've had the privilege to meet each of our panelists, with one exception, at their home institutions as part of my work uh, with FIP. I welcome each of you to this event. Uh, thank you for being a panelist, and it's great to see you again, even if only virtually this time, and I hope we can meet again in person in the not-too-distant future. So our panelists in alphabetical order, uh, Professor Patricia Acuna Johnson from Chile. She is professor and director of the Masters in Hospital and Healthcare Pharmacy Management Program at the University of El Paraiso, and is president of the National Autonomous Corporation for Certification of Pharmaceutical Specialties. She's a member of FIP's academic section and is one of the leads of the Workforce Development Hub within FIP on Workforce Development Goal Number One, which is academic capacity, and is Executive Secretary of the Pan American Conference for Pharmacy Education. Welcome, Patricia. Professor Suresh Bojraj from India. He is President of the Pharmacy Council of India, which is responsible for steering pharmacy education and the profession of pharmacy in India and he's also a member of the Indian Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. He serves as pro-chancellor of JSS University in Mysuru, India, and also is an international commissioner of the Accreditation Council of Pharmacy Education uh, uh, headquartered in the US. So welcome, Suresh. Ms. Jenny Lates from Namibia. Jenny is a pharmacist and lecturer in the School of Pharmacy at the University of Namibia. She worked for 16 years in Namibia's public health system before joining the university. She's responsible for undergraduate research and experiential learning at the pharmacy school, as well as the Masters of Clinical Pharmacy program. Although I've, I have visited the University of Namibia, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting her uh, until uh, I met her 
on this event. So welcome, Jenny, and it's good to meet you. Dr. Derek Munkombe from Zambia. Derek is a pharmacist and a lecturer in the Department of Pharmacy in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Zambia. He holds a PhD in pharmacy and has a strong background in pharmacy education. He is currently the lead person uh, for the FIP UNESCO UNITWIN program, Center for Excellence in Africa and the Needs-Based Education section. Dr. Nguyen Van Hung from Vietnam. Dr. Hung is vice president responsible for graduate education, research and international cooperation at the Haiphong University of Medicine and Pharmacy and is the founding dean for the Faculty of Pharmacy. He's a board member of the Asian Conference on Clinical Pharmacy and a member of the Asian Associations of Schools of Pharmacy. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Hung when I visited his university for the 2016 annual conference of the Asian Association of Schools of Pharmacy. Welcome, Dr. Hung. Ms. Allison Williams from Nigeria and the University of Port, Port Harcourt. Allison is chairperson of the pharmacy education at the, at the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation, IPSF, the leading international advocacy organization representing over a half a million pharmacy students with the aim to promote improved public health through the provision of information, education, and networking opportunities. It's a pleasure having you with us, Allison, uh, to share the student and the young pharmacist perspective on these inequity issues. And I might add, it's a pleasure working with Allison in our UNITWIN program in Africa. So those are our six panelists. Um, we have several areas for them to explore. Um, and I will start by asking the first question, which will be posed to each of our panelists. And that is, what are the, the three most critical inequities that you see in your institution and the negative consequences you have encountered during the COVID-19 pandemic to deliver your pharmacy education program? And for Allison, we'd ask you to respond to this from the student perspective and how that has affected you in receiving your education. I'll remind each panelist you have four minutes to address uh, this first question before we go on to the next ones. So I'll begin with uh, Dr. Suresh. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Um, um, India was not an exception um, to challenges and inequities that arise uh, uh, out of this, uh, that has arisen out of the pandemic. Uh, the three most uh, challenging things which uh, both as an educationist as well as a, a person who is responsible for uh, the governance of pharmacy education in the country we felt was, number one was the assessment of the students. How do we go about it? Uh, yes. um, I mean, uh, teaching on Zoom, teaching other things, fine. But people were not equipped in India. Uh, for assessing students on online, how do I, how do we go about it? Because all along we were familiar with the uh, usual mode of uh, assessing them with pen and paper and uh, year end examination and uh, um, through the year the comprehensive assessment that all was fine. But suddenly we were shifted to a virtual world and we didn't know how to move about. Um, the second uh, challenge which came before us was. Uh, providing students the experiential training that is required. Again, it is a unique system. As we all know, pharmacy has got a great deal of uh, practical as well as uh, clinical experiences which the students have to undergo. And we were caught in the middle of the semester uh, where uh, the, academic, the semester had just begun and um, uh, we could do all the things through Zoom through the, for the theory. But when we come to the clinical or experiential training, we could not uh, reach there. And the third most uh, challenging thing which was uh, there was uh, naturally associated with the people, that is the student and staff welfare. In this pandemic situation, it threw up different type of situations where institutions responded in different way uh, to the various inequities existing in the country. Uh, they responded. So we had to put structure or mechanisms in place to address these inequities that arise out of uh, the student or staff difficulties that might have arisen. I think these three things uh, I would consider as the most uh, challenging uh, proposition that came before us. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was right muted. Now. I was muted there for a minute. <laughs> um, I I would like to point out at this point in time that it's um, the um, challenges that you faced. Uh, FIP actually had uh, two webinars, and if you go to the FIP website, you can get these because they were recorded on uh, two of these uh, issues that you brought up, the assessment and the experiential training. So um, for uh, further insights into those, I think you might want to uh, check those out for anyone yeah. joining us today. So, okay, thank you very much. And now we'll move to Professor Hung um, and, and the challenges that you faced in Vietnam. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good uh, evening for all of you. <coughs> um, actually, uh, in Vietnam, the, <coughs> the situation is not so serious during the, the first time, like the first quarter of uh, 2020, but uh, currently, uh, during the last uh, few weeks, um, the um, um, uh, the problem become uh, a little bit more serious uh, in terms of COVID in Vietnam. So um, there are, uh, I have to say that the first uh, challenge, uh, the first difficulties is that we have to move to from direct uh, lecturing to online, online uh, program. So we teach online, so it limits students to meet with the lecturer and also some poor, some poor students, maybe they have a, a limited access to the lecture compared to the other. So that's, that's, that's one, one, one challenging. The second thing is that the students uh, have a less opportunity to come to the community pharmacy and hospital to contact with the clients and, and teams and uh, they have a they, they, they did not have opportunity to practice uh, experience in the real community, uh, community pharmacy and hospital. And the third one, the third one is that we uh, limited ourselves to invite professors from other country. And also we uh, normally every year we receive some uh, students from other country to come to Vietnam to practice uh, pharmacy and also we send our lecturer and uh, student to the other country to practice pharmacy, like Korea, Canada, uh, and Thailand. But now we, we cannot do that. And also we cannot invite and, and welcome the professor, our friend, to come to Vietnam to give lecture on pharmacy. So that is uh, something uh, very challenging and uh, for us, um, right now, and during the last, uh, I think, seven, six months. And we don't know uh, when we can uh, work again normally, yeah, as, as normal. As. So um, that, that's all for me uh, from Vietnam. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hung. Um, I would like to just we have a few minutes here to to stop and ask a question for both of you because you both brought up the experiential component of your curriculum and then the others might respond to this as well was that because the community and the hospital sites were not accepting students which is what we have experienced in in my world uh, actually uh, both the university and the hospital trying to reduce uh, contact because of we are preventing from COVID-19. Actually, um, if we try, maybe the, the community, the, the pharmacy and hospitals, they may receive students, but with, with hesitation. And that's why yes. to, uh, to be safe, we, we try to stop that activity. Okay. Both for um, the, the students and also for the health, uh, settings yes yeah. and uh, dr suresh India, yeah we had yeah. two situations one was uh, basically the most of the students were away at uh, their homes because when the pandemic started uh, the universities uh, closed down 
and ask the students who were not willing to stay in the uh, hostels or residences to move away to their homes, right. mm -hmm. uh, which was far away from the practice sites where they were. So that was the first challenge for them, you know, like they had gone back to their hometown. And second was, uh, uh, the, uh, naturally, the hesitation to go to a healthcare facility or wherever the healthcare is being provided for the worry of uh, uh, contacting uh, a patient who may be having a, a infection and then uh, become a, a part of the whole, even if we give protective wear and uh, all those things, uh, but risking for the purpose of only learning, uh, I think it was not considered wise. Uh, if it was a question of providing care, uh, one can understand that such uh, protection is given and the uh, person are in, engaged in the purposes. So I think these two reasons basically kept the students away from having the experiential education. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we're going to move on to Allison, our student now, and she can give us the student perspective um, on these uh, issues as well. Allison? Thank you very much, Ralph. And um, just um, to thank um, Dr. Shiraz and Professor Hong for sharing their perspective on these. Their inputs have actually reflected some of the findings that IPSF discovered during the global survey to kind of um, assess the extent of this COVID-19 pandemic on pharmacy education of students. So um, basing, based on the outcomes of this survey, we discovered a lot of inequities across the globe, but very important here, I would like to share the first one, which was inequities in the availability and the quality of remote education opportunities. So we have that based on this survey, 99% of pharmacy students across the globe had their education affected due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, only 69% of the students had the opportunity to continue their education remotely, which means to a great extent, a good percentage of students had no available opportunities for this remote education, showing inequities in their learning experience, the gap, the lab time, and um, we have to think from the perspective that these students today are the future pharmaceutical workforce, and they will be expected at some point to deliver life-saving pharmaceutical services in these regions of the world where they are not able to get learning at this um, point in time. So this may lead to shortage of adequate, adequately trained pharmaceutical workforce in those regions. Another um, inequity that we discovered, which is also really important was for those that were actually receiving the remote education, so what was the quality of this um, remote education? Based on the survey, we discovered that a lot of students actually um, had issues with the asynchronous approach to learning. And this was very obvious because of the lack of student interaction with the faculty and the professors. And they actually found it difficult to um, understand and to focus. Um, keeping in view that pharmacy profession is a scientific profession as well as a patient-facing profession, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a lot of inequities um, trying to adapt to the blended approach of learning, the theory, the practical, the experiential learning. This should actually run concurrently to ensure that the student get the good learning and understanding they have. However, these imbalances in the availability and the quality of the remote education is quite unfair to the affected students. Another important equity that I would like to stress before my time is up was um, the availability of resources to actually implement the remote education. So we have different students, due to their different geographical region 
and their financial status are not actually adequately equipped with the resources like access to internet, data packages, devices like smartphones, laptops, to um, connect to these remote learning opportunities. And um, additionally, resources like even having a conducive learning environment, which Dr. Sharif has already mentioned, all these um, affect their focus and understanding. And imperatively, we, we um, believe that this will, to an extent, have futuristic impact on the pharmaceutical workforce of the students in that environment. We are also concerned that this might lead to brain drain in the future, and there are really inequities that I concern to us. Thank you very much. Allison, thank you so much for that um, information from your survey. I think it's very, very informative for uh, everyone on this call and for all the academics who are providing uh, education uh, as best they can. And, and um, we'll, we'll look a little bit later how we might be able to address some of those inequities. So thank you very much. Uh, Jenny, um, your turn from Namibia. Thank you, Val, for this opportunity to share our experiences from UNAM School of Pharmacy. Inequity is an issue of national concern in Namibia, given that the country's history of apartheid, which only ended in, at independence in 1990, provided, built, it caused a lot of inequity. So Namibia has got one of the highest levels of income inequality in the world and the University of Namibia aims to provide quality training to reduce these historical inequities. Face-to-face -face education was halted nationwide in mid-March and all of the UNAM teaching was moved online to the Moodle um, platform. Uh, luckily, the School of Pharmacy, we were a bit ahead of the game because we'd already decided that all of our modules should be taught with blended learning. So we had started putting all of our courses up on Moodle and we ran two trainings. We'd already run two trainings for lecturers before the lockdown began. The most uh, critical inequities that we've been, we experienced during the first semester and they will continue during the second semester are uh, related to the students and their access. As Alison was mentioning, that there's such a difference in what students are, the resources that students have. The main one that we had was students, um, they had returned home, the same like in India, that they had gone back to their homes, they'd left their campuses, and they had trouble accessing internet. UNAM had provided all students with internet dongles, to increase their access to internet, but a lot of our students live in very rural areas where either the dongle didn't work well or didn't work at all. So this was um, a big problem for them. This resulted in students who did have access to funds buying packages with another internet provider and using their own money so they could access the internet but you can imagine those who didn't have any access to additional funds were then struggling. So they had to, by any means possible, try and access the internet mm -hmm. in order to continue their learning, such as going to family members, workplaces, and then if something was happening in the evening and the workplace was shut, it was a major issue. The second issue, again, was with the students, as many of them didn't have a suitable device for accessing the internet internet even if they had an a even if they were able to get internet access the device for learning was not there whether it was uh, not having a laptop or a tablet and some students not even having a smartphone or no phone at all then some students had um, these devices but they didn't have any electricity in their house so you can it doesn't help to have a device and internet access if there's no power in your device so that is another big problem. And the way that we got to find out about all these, I ran um, a survey of all our Bachelor of Pharmacy students within about three weeks of going uh, 
online with our learning so that we could see what was happening and find out if students were having problems and trying to address those problems as best we could, assisting with computer problems or problems with the Moodle system. Uh, we also had problems with experiential training, but we managed in the end to, we have four placements in our bee farm course and two of them were due to happen in June. We actually postponed them up till July and we managed our students to go out on their rural placement, which is their first placement in district hospitals, public hospitals. They went for two weeks each and the industrial placement, normally the students go to across Africa to different manufacturing companies. Obviously that couldn't happen. This time we managed to organize, the, the, do some hands-on training in our labs producing different um, formulations as well as visiting the National Medicine Regulator and uh, Quality Surveillance Laboratory of the Ministry of Health and visiting one packaging company. So we did manage to get uh, experiential training in. Um, but those are our main issues. Thank you. So thank you, Jenny. That's um, a, a difficult problems to overcome for sure. Um, but thank you for that that insight from um, your part of the world, and um, we'll we'll come back to uh, what we. A little bit more of how we might uh, address some of these. So, uh, Patricia, Chile. Uh, you're muted. You have to unmute. Yes. Well, uh, okay, we can hear you now. Yes, I represent Latin America and the region uh, that I belong to. All the forecasts uh, of international organizations indicate that the impact of this pandemic will be greater than in the rest of the world because from the beginning, uh, we have faced it from a weaker position. So um, I would say that we have done the best we can although the problems we have faced. So economic and social inequities are mainly those uh, we find uh, at the student level, but also at the teachers and the institutional level. A number of students uh, that have uh, limited access to proper, proper technological resources and to internet, and many of them usually uh, use their own smartphones to, connect it, uh, to connecting learning activities, mainly lectures, I would say. Some schools have provided tablets and funds to access to internet connection uh, to all those students that, that need it to avoid or decrease the gap. This inequity is also institutional, which implies greater spending from their restricted uh, budgets. The second critical inequity is that only a limited number of higher education institutions in Latin America count on adequate uh, platforms, electronic platforms, for undergraduate e-learning activities, nor have appropriate technical teams or at least enough people to provide the support that teachers uh, need for the use of ICT. This is a very important issue if you want to assure quality of pharmaceutical education. Some universities were well prepared in managing uh, platforms and using, in using e-learning uh, platforms and methodologies before the start of the pandemic, but others had to do it on the run with different uh, results. Lastly, but not least, gender inequity is one of the most important to mention uh, in this session. About half of our students are women and some of them are single mothers. Uh, whether they are or not uh, mothers, more often they have jobs to help them to make their living and pay their necessities. During this period, they are not working and have to take care of their children 
daycares are closed, for example. And, um, and also of home duties and studies. This is a cultural issue, by the way. So a lack of support mechanisms is also an important issue and med mental health is needed to address. This is what I have to mention about all the, the problems in our countries in Latin America. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Now that was um, a, a really good um, assessment of the uh, gender inequity issues uh, that um, we haven't heard from yet, but I'm sure they've existed uh, in all programs um, and we've experienced, not just for the students, but for the faculty as well. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm sure you've had that issue also. So, yeah, um, maybe, I maybe we can, myself as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we can revisit that issue a little bit later as well. Uh, so, Derek, uh, Zambia. Thank you so much, uh, Ralph, for giving us an opportunity from Zambia as well to share our experiences uh, regarding the inequities that our students, farmer students, are facing in Zambia. I would like to state it uh, from the outset that um, teaching and learning activities at the University of Zambia for the farmer students are conducted through the Moodle and the Astria e-learning platforms. And what that means is that um, for students who are not um, registered or fully registered with the university uh, are unable to access these learning um, platforms through the university website. So there are three um, prominent inequities that our students are experiencing. One of them is that some students come from rural areas where the internet access is erratic. So students are unable to access the learning materials and participate in the learning activities um, such as uh, tests and assignments. But what the university has done, the University of Zambia has done, is to engage the mobile phone service providers to introduce special internet access plans, uh, which are meant to increase the internet accessibility and reduce the costs of, uh, asso associated with the internet use. Then the second um, inequity is that some students and uh, able also um, to do uh, certain components of the courses that require hands-on, like others have already mentioned, in terms of experiential learning. So students are unable to do laboratory experiments. They are unable to do um, clinical clerkships, and, and so on and so forth. So um, what has been identified is that uh, for the final year student especially, if they do not do their clinical components or attachments, then it will be very difficult for them to graduate. So what the Ministry of Higher Education in Zambia has done is to take a practical step. Since Africa and uh, Zambia in particular, initially was not so much uh, hard hit by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the ministry decided to use the, um, the measures that are in place to enforce them and make sure that um, our final year students, they open the classes so that they can interact with the uh, uh, teachers physically. And so in Zambia, the those classes that are in the final year, in the examination classes, they have opened and they're interacting with um, their uh, teachers practically. The, the, the third thing is that um, it borders on gender also, um, is that some students find it um, very hard to write tests and quizzes online. Uh, why, I mention, why I say that it bases on gender is that um, a female gender, uh, when schools are closed and they are 
working, uh, they are learning from home, they are given more house chores than the boys. And this makes it very, very difficult, especially when it comes to write tests and quizzes. So um, these students have always, are always behind um, the schoolwork that they are expected to do. What the university has done in this regard is um, to arrange for online uh, training for uh, some of these students who are lagging behind so that uh, if they need extra orientation beyond what they already uh, know, they are assisted. And also there has been um, some support teams designated to resolve some of these challenges that students are facing. So those that are behind, the, the schools, uh, respective schools are able to follow up uh, with those students and help them so that they can catch up with work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Derek, um, and for bringing up some of these uh, new issues as well. <clears throat> So we can see that we have some commonalities uh, in uh, the uh, various uh, disruptions that have occurred um, in various ways that uh, countries have uh, tried to um, uh, help out and curb some of the negative effects. So the next question sort of uh, brings us to a place where we can address these um, um, interventions a bit more and uh, this is, uh, what have you learned from your experience thus far to help address these inequities? I think we, we heard from each of our panelists a little bit of that, so we can expound on it a bit more. Um, and we'll start with Patricia in, uh, from Chile. Thank you, Ralph. Well, uh, based on my own experience, I would say that in situations of change, it is essential to have the support and the understanding of the university, uh, university authorities and administrators at all levels of the organization. To overcoming inequities requires effort, determination, organization, flexibility to adequate to new scenarios, to be proactive and support students during their learning process, understand that what we could not be, what haven't been able to be done uh, today can be done tomorrow. And I, I say this because experiential activities and those are done in hospitals, community pharmacies, and health institutions are in depth, but not forever. So we have to move to a blended education starting now. Institutional commitment from all the actors uh, that are part of the educational process of our students is central. The use of digital technologies is here to stay, and it is necessary to con consider it in our budget expenses to, to subsidize lower income students um, uh, for their prompt access to, to these technologies. On the other hand, teachers must keep themselves updated on e learning uh, methodologies mm -hmm. and forms of evaluations to ensure that no students abandon their courses. Overall, the pharmacy curriculum must meet quality standards in spite of the situation. Pharmacists have demonstrated their key role in the pandemic and we as educators should not disappoint our students mm -hmm. and the society. Okay. This is it. <clears throat> I would agree. <laughs> Those very good points that you made there. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, Derek, um, tell us a little bit more about um, uh, how you've uh, managed some of these inequities in Zambia. Thank you, um, Rav. I think we have learned uh, quite a number of lessons uh, during this time of COVID-19. Uh, some of the lessons that we've uh, learned is that actually we assumed that uh, probably most of the students will easily afford some of these electronic gadgets. But we've learned that not all students have electronic gadgets to access the e-learning that we have rolled out. And uh, 
we are busy looking at ways on how these students can actually be helped. Uh, the other thing that we've learned is that uh, not all students actually are registered, like I mentioned, uh, much earlier. They are uh, meaning that they cannot access the, the Moodle platform that we are predominantly using in our university. And so what we have done is uh, to use alternative platforms. And we have utilized so much of the Zoom platform uh, because this one, even when a student is not registered, they will still be able to attend class. What it is in our setting is that um, students um, will come into the university, but they were given a period of time in which to register. And they are given a threshold of uh, how much in terms of school fees or tuition fees should be paid for them to be put on the university portal. So for those that are still in the waiting list, uh, who have not yet met that criteria, they still need also to learn. And Mood, uh, Zoom platform has uh, proved to be quite helpful, um, hoping that um, they will register and then they, we can carry them on, on on Moodle. But Moodle disadvantages them in the sense that they can do the learning but they cannot do. Uh, they cannot be assessed. They cannot take a test. They cannot take an assignment. Then the other thing that we've learned is that some students, especially girls, like I mentioned again, uh, that um, they are they attend more to house chores. In our culture, uh, most of the girls actually they help a lot in the kitchen, and so when they are at home and learning from home, they expected that they will prepare meals for the family, and so this is disadvantaging. Uh, girls because they have less time to concentrate on their on their books and this is something we are thinking of how can we uh, carry out a sensitization and um, reach the families so that uh, the, the girl child also can be given more time to concentrate on the books thank you so much okay <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Suresh. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Uh, um, here in India, I had a different type of challenge also along with uh, finding solutions for it because uh, as the president of Pharmacy Council of India, I had the responsibility of not only managing my university where uh, these inequities be addressed, but nationally address it. So, the immediately the first step which we did at the national level at the pharmacy council was uh, to give out a very clear reassuring uh, message and uh, also uh, policy or guidances to all the universities across how the pharmacy education uh, in this pand pandemic time be addressed you know we laid down specific guidelines so that the students uh, feel comfortable teachers feel comfortable and that initial uh, the fear uh, situation is uh, diluted or reduced. So we did that immediately as soon as uh, it was early March when it started uh, all in India. We said, no, let's put something out before based on what happened in experiences in the US and other parts of the uh, world. We said, let's not wait for things to happen and decide. Let's put the things in place. So that reduced the uh, panic situation. And uh, we gave solutions also when we knew assessment, we said, you can have the assessment whenever the time permits. Don't look at the rigid calendar where you have to complete. Try to find blended mode of assessments, some in person if it is possible. If not, go on an online mode. Try to work out ways which can ease the uh, comfort, ease and make comfort for the students and teachers to uh, do the assessments. Similarly, in experiential training, we encourage the uh, faculty and students to be innovative and uh, go on uh, two modes. One is they can get their experiential training in whichever hometown they are. They can go and register if their hospital or their pharmacy permits them uh, to get their training. We were okay with that. Otherwise, it was earlier, they should go only to an approved center to get their training. Uh, now we let that relax until you do wherever you are, you try to gain the experiential training and uh, try to gain the skills that is required under the mentor and let it be coordinated with the faculty who is uh, teaching you along. And lastly, we did was we encouraged a lot of uh, young teachers to innovate 
bring out simulation videos which they would like to um, uh, share with the students. And we conducted a couple of webinars also for the faculty on how to engage students uh, on uh, what you call as practice schools by online method. How do we do online clinical experiences by OSCE and other uh, modes that are required? So we try to address these solutions also giving. And just now in the uh, 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 you know uh, just uh, this last meeting in the council, we took the decision even to act give them. We have negotiated with some of the platform providers to make accessible to all the students and institutions across the country at least for a period of three months or six months these platforms free of cost. Uh, uh, to the institutions to uh, learn, uh, do their clinical experiential training or uh, recording the data and information that is associated with it possible. So we facilitate at each stage to address these inequities. Um, but the ma major challenge which we feel is going to be there is when the campuses reopen, when it happens, we do not know, but when do they happen, how are we going to address it? So that's the vision which we are now working on. Uh, how do we reduce uh, challenges for the teachers and increase the safety for the students and uh, staff? This is the thing. Regarding the student and uh, staff welfare, which I addressed briefly, as you all know, when uh, there is a lot of resources are tied up, uh, the first thing every organization tries to do is to reduce the human resource cost. They do not worry about anything else. They want to reduce the human resource cost. Uh, so we had to again put out our message to all the institutions uh, not to be so uh, focused on resources only and if this is the time to give and not to take and try to be more considerate. I think that also brought about a good peace message across the uh, faculty and students to continue with their education and provide education. Uh, really good insights there, uh, Suresh. And I, I, I just want to point out one thing that I that you said that I think is really important, and that is um, the innovations that the faculty have done on the fly while they're learning and the students are learning, and they've um, they've really um, innovated uh, for online education. Probably things they didn't think they could do, but they did. Yes. And, and we owe a, a great a debt of gratitude to the faculty for stepping up and doing that. I, I think that's, that's a really, really good point. And, and I think this other, the other factor of guidance from the top down uh, to help this fear factor issue uh, is, is very, very important. So thanks for those insights. Thank you. Um, we'll go to our last area uh, for uh, our other three panelists, and that is, uh, what might be some possible collaborations or partnerships between other um, universities or countries that might help address uh, some of these inequities? And we'll start with uh, Jenny Lates from Namibia. Thank you, Ralph. Um, the UNAM School of Pharmacy was able to continue teaching more smoothly than some of the other faculties in our university because the school since its inception has actively pursued op opportunities to integrate technology into all levels of our pharmacy training. This has involved innovation but also outside support. For example, by means of his work with FIP, our founding associate dean Prof Rennie became aware of the My Dispense software. So through discussions with Monash University, UNAM has been able to be the first African country to implement the use of this My Dispense software mm -hmm. in training our undergraduate students. And we greatly appreciate the support from both FIP and especially Monash University, who continue to support UNAM's use of My Dispense for free. Another example is the school's collaboration with Strathclyde University, which allows our students to learn using their virtual pharmacology suite so that they can have a real experience with pharmacology that can't be done hands-on in our university. Mm -hmm. Based on our experience in UNAM, I believe that the building relationships between schools of pharmacy across the globe can be key way to reduce some of the inequities in pharmacy education that we currently see. If all universities with innovative teaching methods and tools were to share their ideas and tools with uh, other schools of pharmacy, this would strengthen pharmacy education globally. And I feel that FIP is ideally 
placed to assist in identifying suitable, use, useful, and innovative sorry, pharmacy education tools. If FIP could maybe host a page on their website giving details of these different tools and links to who, which university owns them, this could maybe go a long way towards bridging some of the gaps that we have with current inequities. Thank you. Good suggestion there, Jenny. <laughs> and I made myself a note of who to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Allison. Thank you very much, um, Jenny. Those um, suggestions are really insightful. And um, it's actually one of my first points, which was also about best practice sharing and kind of virtual academic exchanges. So this can be like a possible collaboration between countries and schools of pharmacy and um, they will partner to ex um, share resources because it's really important to um, learn from what you don't know, get support from who you could get support from because all in all, we are all one pharmacy, one FIP, we're delivering one pharmaceutical service. And I would really um, advocate and encourage this kind of collaboration. Um, also, additionally, understanding that these um, inequities are foundational issues, like institutional issues, and sometimes would require some policy changes, and improvements, um, I would recommend um, joint partnerships for solidarity and advocacy during these times, as um, we are all sharing common issues and having a common voice towards advocating for a change around these inequities can be really valuable at times like this. Then um, one additional, um, idea and collaboration i was thinking could be a solution could be to have um, a joint massive online open classes for school of pharmacy so as um, earlier identified we have that some students actually don't have any opportunity whatsoever for remote education so they are not learning at all and um, if we could have interregional um, collaborations to host this massive open online courses. It would be really valuable to support the institutions um, which may not be able to host it individually and at the same time um, train the pharmacy students globally. Thank you very much. Okay, so s some good ideas there, Allison. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to Dr. Hung. Thank you for, uh, let me have some uh, thought on that. I think there are several ways to uh, collaborate because during this time we have to conduct uh, online costs. So, uh, Actually, we don't have a much experience on that. And then it would be much better if we can get support from better off uh, partner countries. Maybe you say like a relevant cost and, uh, and, and with us and we can connect together. And, and, and I think it's one of the way to help the country where we don't have a, um, experience in planning uh, especially uh, online cost for mm -hmm. students for a long time. The second thing that I think that we, we also should uh, promote the international conference uh, online because uh, like, like this forum, like, like today, we have a lot of opportunity to learn from uh, each other. So that is a very, uh, very possible to conduct uh, uh, more frequent uh, communication mm -hmm. online like that. That is a uh, one way. And the, the last one, I think um, we also can uh, work on the planning together 
to have some kind of future activity or even the research during this time based on the internet based we can do some some research together or research um, or we can plan some activity uh, preparing for after covid maybe mm -hmm. hopefully after some months maybe covid is over so we do something to um, uh, to uh, like a, um, benefits from this time because we don't have uh, much time to go directly working with students and, 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 and community also. So that's something from my thought. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you uh, to all the panelists for um, the insights you've given us into the inequities you've experienced and, and how you're addressing those. Um, so Nilhan, I think that uh, we are um, ready to go to uh, some questions from our audience. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for that? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've been monitoring the chat box, the Q&A box. First of all, uh, as all of you have pointed out, you've been facing similar challenges and our participants were sharing their experiences through the chat box. And the, the inequities and the challenges are the same. But today mm -hmm. at this platform, we will discuss finding global solutions that you can apply in your nations, in your regions. And um, I wanted to point out that uh, there has been a discussion in the chat box around that. Also, we received some of suggestions because there were some issues around tackling experience, experiential learning issues. Mm -hmm. And an option would be recording a day uh, of uh, the life of a pharmacist to get different aspects of uh, different specialties and creating inter interactive case studies around that. And that was a very interesting suggestion that we received in order to tackle the experiential learning issue that we are facing. Uh, coming to the questions, uh, we have received a couple of questions. So I'll just list them out and then, I'm sorry, and uh, perhaps you may, uh, th these may were uh, targeted to all panelists, but uh, I'll share them with you, Ralph, in order to address it to the, to the right panelists. Mm -hmm. First question, we discussed this uh, more or less, but there was a question from one of our panelists, if there are any governments that provide any compensations or solutions regarding, regarding uh, the technological problems experienced by students, faculty members, staff, or was it always um, met by the, the institution itself in terms of providing bundles or access to technological uh, equipment? So this was the first question. And the second question was uh, directed to Patricia and Derek, but of course other panelists who uh, wish to answer can pick this question as well. Uh, we discussed gender inequities and barriers uh, towards the facilitating online pharmacy education, especially in the, in the context of current disruptions. So um, is there any other strategy or any, um, uh, any, any type that you envision, any type of solution that you envision to solve this problem in the future? Anything that, that can be done by the faculty? or can there be an online or physical learning to overcome these challenges? So the question was more around the gender inequities and asking for more um, mm -hmm. practical solutions, also future-proof solutions. So this question was to Patricia and Derek. And the last question was about, as there was a, a transition to online learning uh, or remote learning, was there any capacity building uh, provision to the staff that is that has to uh, utilize online learning uh, equipment or the system uh, from the institution? So was there any capacity building provided to support faculty staff uh, in order to uh, in order to provide online education? So these were three main questions we received from our panelists. Okay, so um, let me go to the gender inequity one and ask uh, both Patricia and Derek 
if they could provide a bit more insight um, into uh, some of the specifics of how they're addressing those uh, problems or maybe not what has been done, but what do you think should be done or can be done by the university or by your governments to address that? So let's start with Patricia. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Uh, thank you for the question as well. Well, um, uh, to, to be honest, I am very surprised uh, that this issue of gender in, uh, equity hasn't, hasn't been addressed uh, deeply enough in our institutions and in our schools. Mainly, we are mainly uh, uh, women in, in our uh, pharmacy schools. So usually I'm not in favor of, of positive discrimination about women, but I, nowadays I think sometimes it is necessary. It is necessary. Um, I think what we can do and we haven't done as, as yet is that to, um, to, to improve the possibility of having webinars at different levels. I know that at a global level, and FIP is, is taking care of that, uh, but also at an, a regional level, uh, let's say Latin America or America uh, itself, um, at a local level in, 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 in our country, but also in our, in our own institutions, because uh, I think that we learn from others. So as long as we have many experiences from somebody else that is having the same problems, the same um, uh, heading, the, the same uh, uh, situations that we have uh, been uh, uh, living, uh, you get ideas and, and you get, after all, you feel better as well. So um, I think we have uh, the, at the institutional level, not, on, not only with webinars, but also with support economical support um, during, uh, during the, the um, lockdown with online um, support and physical support uh, while, uh, afterwards, after when, when this ends. So um, I, I can't imagine right now another kind of, um, another kind of, uh, another idea because uh, limitations are because of the quarantine. But later on, I think, uh, I mean, during this time, um, institutional support, online institutional support might be use, uh, useful, but later on, um, being more active in giving and in taking care of this, of this issue and giving more support to our students. And as you said, to our, to our, um, to our um, uh, faculties, women faculties as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, in addition to what uh, Patricia has um, actually brought out, I, this is a very important um, actually inequity, especially in our setting here in Africa. Um, as you may all know, is that um, in Africa, the issue of um, uh, civic education in general and probably gender education in, in, in general is uh, still uh, lagging behind and we need to, to work on this. And like uh, Patricia said, even in our institutions, very little has been done uh, to correct the situation uh, concerning gender. The example that I gave was that of um, um, a boy and a girl coming from the same family and then they reach home and the girl is expected to go to the kitchen and prepare the meals while the boy goes to the, either to the bedroom or elsewhere and picks books and starts studying. So really that is a serious disparity um, which must be addressed. And how this uh, can be addressed, first and foremost, um, is to identify the, the most affected uh, group. Uh, in this case, the, the girls themselves. 
uh, the universe has to put up some kind of a mechanism, a reporting mechanism uh, for the girls so that they are free. If they feel that um, they are not getting uh, most out of um, the online type of learning uh, because they are at home, I think they should uh, report, uh, there should be a mechanism of reporting to the system so that the system can take up such issues and then follow up and see how these uh, vulnerable uh, children can be assisted. Uh, we, we admit that we haven't done very well, but um, I think um, in addition to what Patricia said, uh, we need to take a, up an active role and see how we can bring this uh, disparity to a level where um, it's very minimal and students are able to learn um, in a convenient uh, manner. Thank you so much. Is there any other panelists that would like to weigh in on this gender inequity issue? Maybe I can just say a few words okay. from Namibia. Um, ma the majority of our students are female. The number of males in our classes is very limited, but they still get the same issue. And then you know, several of our students are mature students who have children and they're not only expected to cook the meal, but they're meant to help their children with online learning and that majority falls to the female. Thinking about this problem and how it can be solved, I don't think it can be solved by any institution. This has to be taken up by the society. Until the society treats females the same as males, then this problem is going to continue. So you will end, you will have some of our female students, they are very strong and they put aside, they make sure that their learning doesn't get compromised. Mm -hmm. But if the female is not in a position to speak up in their own household, then definitely they will end up struggling between childcare, cooking, household duties, and then the last option when they're exhausted is then to go and do their studies. But I don't see any university being able to solve this issue. It's a societal one. Okay, well, um, as I said uh, earlier, I think this is an issue uh, certainly for our students and their learning, but um, we also see it on the faculty side as well. And I think it's something we need to uh, obviously pay more attention to. And I think that within the uh, structure at FIP now, the WISE program, uh, Nilhan knows uh, more about that. Uh, I think this is an issue that uh, perhaps they can help to address um, from different perspectives and, and maybe bring people together uh, to help uh, create innovative solutions uh, to, to, this, to these issues. Uh, so let's see, the other question was uh, governments providing compensation uh, for uh, addressing some of these problems um, or is it the burden of the universities only which uh, I am certain have had their budgets cut, cut as well so um, who would like to um, uh, discuss that? I think, okay, Jenny, I'll come to you in just a second. But Suresh made some comments about not compensation, but the uh, intervention on the part of uh, the council and the ministry. And maybe he could uh, lead us off in this discussion. And then we'll go to you, Jenny. Can I just um, interrupt? To just expand the question a little bit while we were discussing okay. the first question we had we had other questions that might help the answer to expand a little bit more on the same topic about providing technological solutions to students we were also asked whether uh, uh, this is this can be a role of the national pharmacy association and also giving a perspective of the students that live in the rural areas because they are the ones who are mostly affected by this issue. So the, the, the question has expanded a little bit. Okay. I don't yeah. know if, if, if the panelists would be interested in answering this perspective as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ralph. Uh, 
for uh, putting this question towards me. <laughs> um, uh, it's a difficult one, but uh, I'll try to address it uh, as we as we are doing in India. Uh, maybe it was uh, see it is challenging for universities to uh, roll out any additional uh, resources for them to strengthen the students' learning process. They would be able to provide the uh, necessary infrastructure and teaching learning to continue beyond their financial compensation to be given. Uh, I think not many institutions or universities would come forward with that type of thing. And for the government uh, to create uh, support across the universities to equip themselves with uh, uh, the type of infrastructure which students need for learning, Again, it's going to be a big challenge for the governments to do it. What we are trying to do is, is there any mechanism where we can create a national digital platform where even the institutions and students are able to access uh, their learning and teaching to happen from that platform. So that's our exercise. And uh, we are now negotiating with various uh, such uh, providers, uh, how they can give it free of cost initially to the students maybe for three months or six months or whatever it is. And maybe when the pandemic passes over, they can, the institutions can decide to subscribe and uh, pay them. But right now it's for them to make it available, uh, the things. Second thing we would be, of course, we are not at address, but we would be looking at how, how the universities can cut the costs or the fees for the burden of the students. But we have not addressed that issue as such now because we want the things to happen, let the universities move forward, open up, and then we can talk uh, to the universities, how they can uh, reduce the burden of the students towards uh, uh, fees and compensation. So this is the way, as a council, we are trying to be a mentor, uh, both to the institutions, in the sense, encourage them to continue to provide education and not to, uh, be, uh, not to pose difficulties. At the same time, reassure students not to worry, we'll try to help you as much as possible and move forward. In the middle come the faculty who are facing the brunt uh, from the point that they do not have resources. Suddenly, they were pushed from physical teaching to uh, technological teaching from home. They are not equipped for that, so they had to use their own resources and do it. And at the same time, the universities may lay off or laying off in few places that faculty that we are not able to afford you to pay uh, more compensation over the period of time or even cutting their compensations. So these are the challenges. So we are trying to look at it, how we can address it. And uh, we are getting back to the institution, trying to be a bridge. So this is how as a government, government or a council, we are trying to address it at a personalized level. Uh, it may be difficult in all the countries to do that, but definitely as was suggested by Nihan, that professional organizations like uh, FIP or even the national level organizations can start uh, uh, sort of uh, advocating these issues to a level where the governments are, are, are expected to take certain decisions. Okay. Okay, Jenny, you had some comments you wanted to make. Thank you, Ralph. Um, regarding the issue of whether government is, is providing any support or to the students or whether it's left up to the institutions, mm -hmm. in Namibia, the government has announced that they're providing support. Uh, financial support will go through the Student Financial Assistance Fund to get uh, laptops for students who don't have any resources. So that is in supplementing what the university is doing. The university already has agreement with one of the um, internet providers in the country, telecom, and those are the dongles that have already been given to students, but they are not working so well in rural areas. So again, further discussions are going on with the secondary internet provider to try and address that. The issue of um, involving maybe the National Pharmaceutical Society in addressing some of these inequities. In Namibia, the Pharmacy Student Society is set up that they 
created by the students themselves and they liaise, they work together with major players in the pharmacy sector in Namibia to try and raise sponsorship and support for students who are coming from less well-off backgrounds to try and solve some of these problems as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, anyone else have uh, any input on that particular question? The, the other question that we have is somewhat related to this, and that is, um, is there any capacity building that's being planned um, by the institution as we move forward, not only in the pandemic, but post-pandemic um, period? I think it's somewhat related to that first question. Is, yeah. is there anyone that has Can I set provide up? insights on that? Yes. Yeah, I think capacity building is what we are actually now working on, uh, both through the, uh, through the institutions as well as through the professional organizations. We are now uh, trying to help uh, all the teachers and uh, uh, to be trained uh, to get on to uh, online teaching and developing uh, resources, learning resources and teaching resources. Uh, that can be available to the students when they come back. We are for sure knowing that even if the students come back to campus, it will not be 100% physical teaching. Uh, there has to be a blended way of teaching for some time at least more. So that means it requires more resources. So we are already encouraging them uh, to develop uh, learning resources that has to be available. And mm -hmm. uh, for that, whatever support is required, the council is moving forward and doing. Right. Um, I'm going to guess that what you just said is probably going to be true for everybody, but I'll have them chime in. Do you see the post COVID era as being blended learning as opposed to the way we did things back in January <laughs> before COVID? Yes, I think for sure it will be blended yeah. learning. Yeah. So Patricia, how do you see things going in uh, your area? You see uh, blended learning being the future? That's for sure. I think nothing is going to be the same way it used to be before uh, COVID-19. This has been an opportunity to rethink our curriculum and our uh, methodologies for mm -hmm. learning. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure about it. Eric? Thank you so much, Ralph. At the University of Zambia, uh, we have this ICT uh, department. And so what they have been trying to do is to not only develop capacity in terms of uh, the use of um, ICT in the students, but also the lecturers themselves. So um, like I mentioned much earlier, is that uh, special committees have been formed uh, which will facilitate the, the transfer of some of these skills so that um, um, both the, the learners and the students as well as the facilitators as well as lecturers are up to date uh, with the online uh, techniques. Um, in terms of um, uh, online techniques, I think um, our, um, our lecturers now are up to speed and those that I uh, think that they are not up to speed. There is an opportunity, there is an avenue for them to to learn further in the in, in the process. So really, um, this is something that um, it should be ongoing. Uh, the question that you asked is: it going to be blended? Yes. In fact, it has been there before, but mm -hmm. uh, it was intensified during this time of COVID nineteen. And going forward probably should be at an equal footing in terms of blending it so that um, we can benefit from uh, both modes of delivering the, the content yes. to the students. So yes. really it's something that um, will stay and um, should be encouraged going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I know we're running short on time, I'll, um, so I'm gonna skip the rest of the panelists for that one. Um, I just, there's one question that I saw come up earlier, and that is, has anyone had to delay graduation because of these disruptions? 
And I'll just ask any panelist that says yes to uh, chime in. We have not so far. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe say something. Um, thank you so much for that question. So in Zambia, the experience that we've had is that um, just last Friday, our students we are graduating online. So the the program yes. uh, was done in such a way that um, the student actually um, forwarded their their, their their nice pictures in gowns, and then um, the graduation took place, and they they, they they graduated. Now for these others who are still um, in 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 class. Um, there is a mitigation measure that has been put, especially for the practicals, because well, these had already done their practicals, so it was very easy for them to graduate. But for those that have yes. not yet done their experiential learning, what has been done is that all the examination mm -hmm. classes have been opened up and they are meeting with their lecturers or interacting with them physically. So th that is seen to, um, to be something that will help uh, to facilitate the graduation of even these that are still uh, in session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Um, it, mm -hmm. In India, Suresh. there was uh, again. This is a, there was an inequity even in this graduation. Like uh, the public funded universities, uh, there is a, a, a delay in the graduation because they are not even gone with the assessments because of the equipping themselves with uh, technology and uh, moving forward uh, for the. But some of the privately funded universities, they have been able to quickly move forward and graduation. So there is a, a diverse situation existing mm -hmm. in this system also. It cannot be say one size fits all uh, here right. also. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, so I'm just going to throw out one word, um, but we don't have time to respond to it. But um, I think we probably are all experiencing this to some extent is the role of telehealth and telepharmacy now and as we go forward. I didn't hear anybody talk about it, but certainly in, in uh, my world here, that has increased a thousand fold from what it was pre-COVID and, and we expect to see more of that going forward too. And that's gonna influence education as well and then how we teach our students to do that. So I think, um, Nilhan, if I'm right, we need to wrap up this uh, Q&A session. Um, I just wanna thank all of our panelists for your uh, great insights, uh, comments, bringing up really important issues uh, that you've had to deal with. I think many of the people on, on this uh, Zoom conference uh, uh, are dealing with as well. Um, and and I, this idea of sharing what we have been through sharing what we're thinking about doing or have done and what we need to do is uh, really important and FIP can play a central role in that. Um, and I'll just mention once again, um, the, um, the FIP website on coronavirus that um, also has a, a quite a bit of information on this for education and practice and science as well. Now we did have one last thing for the panelists to do, but since we only have two minutes left, I'm not sure we'll get there because I think you've already done it. And that was a sentence on what advice you would give uh, to pharmacy educators around the world who are tackling these inequities. But I, I really think you've already given us that advice in your answers uh, to some of these questions and in your comments earlier. So if it's okay with everybody, we'll skip that and we'll go to closing the webinar so we could try to end on time. And again, thank you very much panelists for joining us, taking the time to do it and providing your insights. And thank you to our audience uh, for participating in this, asking a lot of good questions. We obviously couldn't get to all of them. Um, and now I'll turn the program over to Nilhan who will close it out for us. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, I would like to thank sincerely to you as our moderator for excellent moderation and to our speakers panelists for sharing their learnings across Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to connect all together from all these different continents at the same time and also our participants are across the world. So this is a great opportunity to tackle challenges globally because Throughout the webinar, we noticed that we all have common issues 
and as we create this platform, FIP will support to have common solutions at a global scale. All the recommendations, all the messages you received, all the, all the uh, points that our panelists raised, we'll take them into an account and we will tackle them and we'll support the global education community. Uh, so we'll combat this pandemic and its consequences and inequities together. I hope we are leaving uh, you with reflections on how to tackle inequities in pharmacy education in your country. And please watch our space, FIP space, uh, for further support. We will be taking actions around that. Um, final messages, some logistics. Um, the recording of this webinar will be made available at our website, www.fip.org, and it's also on FIP's Facebook page as it's currently live streamed. Uh, please share your feedback through the questions we'll send to you uh, soon and we'll continue our digital event offerings based on your feedback. Your feedback is very important for us. Uh, finally, these global platforms, these platforms are what FI people continue to offer and this is an opportunity for me to invite you all to the first ever virtual FIP Congress that will take place on September 2020. We will discuss global reflections on living and learning through the COVID-19 pandemic. Your waves will be key to combat this pandemic in solidarity. Visit uh, virtual2020.fip.org to learn more and register to our Congress. We are looking forward to see you there. Uh, finally, tomorrow we will have an exciting online launch event entitled An Overview of Current Pharmacy Impact on Immunization, Presentation of Key fun Findings from FIP's Global Report on 2020. So you can join this important launch event on F uh, Pharmacy's New Services and Vaccination. This will take place 1 p.m. Uh, Amsterdam time. You may register from uh, FIP's website. So that's all from our side. Thank you very much to our speakers, our moderator, our participants, and our colleagues in FIP organizing this event. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Have a nice day, evening, afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.